Hi everybody, Dan Bailey here with episode number eight of my Fujifilm retrospective, where I'm looking back at my 10 year journey shooting with the Fujifilm X-Series cameras. Before I get started, I just want to say thanks to everybody who's watched the other videos in this series. It's been a lot of fun to share my own stories and photos from the past few years, and I've really enjoyed reading your comments and hearing your stories as well about your own Fuji life. So keep the comments coming. If you're a new subscriber, then I'd like to welcome you to the channel. Thanks for signing up. I've got a lot of great content up here, so please take some time to check out some of my older videos as well. And finally, I want to remind you guys about my Photography on the Brain lesson series. This is my exclusive 30 lesson video course, where we dive down deeply into the realm of creativity and image making on a much more cerebral level. We explore a wide range of really cool topics that can help you expand your own creativity and your own confidence with the camera as you're working to establish your own photographic style as an artist. I also give you a variety of assignments that challenge you to think about how you can apply these concepts to your own image making in some new ways. So if you'd like to join me on this creative journey and let me help you become the most confident, creative artist that you can be with the camera, you can check out the course right here. Okay, let's get started. 2018 had been another great year for Fujifilm and for me as well. I was using the X-T3, which was the most advanced X-Series camera to date. It had incredible creative features, very powerful video capabilities. By this time, I'd already burned through thousands of frames through the X-T3, and I was really excited by the creative options that it offered, and also the quality. So by the end of 2018, I'd been shooting with the X-T models for five years, and just really excited by the photos I was getting. And I was developing a great relationship with my extended Fujifilm family, with the product managers, the sales reps, and some of the other ex-photographers, and also making friends and contacts with a lot of other Fuji shooters around the world, including you guys who I've met at some of my events around the country. And during that time, I'd crisscrossed the U.S. numerous times giving photo workshops and presentations from Seattle to San Diego, from Florida to New York, from Arkansas to Illinois, and across the Rocky Mountain states, sharing my own insight about how I use the Fujifilm cameras, and again, meeting you guys out there as well. Of course, it's been awesome to hear how my X-Series Unlimited book has become such a helpful resource for so many Fuji shooters around the world. But now we're on to 2019, and the year began as it often does, with some really cold, clear, awesome winter weather in Alaska. I love photographing landscapes in these kind of conditions, and in fact, some of my favorite photos from this time of year are often shot within a half mile of my house where I'm walking on the trail or standing on my front porch looking across at my neighbor's crabapple tree. I shot this one with a 100 to 400, again, just standing on my front porch. Here's another one of my favorite photos from that year, uh, another January photo shot with a 90 millimeter lens looking through the light. You can actually see the hoarfrost crystals reflecting in the sun, uh, just floating in the air. I think that's a really cool effect. I remember taking a fat bike ride on January 4th, just cruising the forest trails on my snow bike, just you know, enjoying the winter solitude and the cold quiet of the forest. And then late in the afternoon, I started to see the light change. I started to see this magical pink light on the trees. And so I descended down this little hill and dropped into a clearing. And so I pulled out my camera and shot a few photos. And it was such a serendipitous event because I'd actually found myself in the exact same place during the exact same time of day, exactly the, to the same day two years prior, on January 4th, 2017. And these are some of the photos I shot during that day. January is also a great time for winter aerial photography for me. Again, it's really cold, it's very laborious to deal with preheating the plane and flying around with an open window when it's 10 below outside or colder, but the, the results are amazing and it's well worth the trouble and the effort. I remember one particular day where I flew out to the Kinnick River Valley and I turned the corner and saw the entire valley was filled with clouds and the tallest mountains were sticking above like islands in the sky. So it was such an interesting view. I'd never seen that kind of look before out there. So of course I went crazy photographing these scenes right out the airplane window. And as with before, most of my aerials that I shoot are straight Velvia JPEGs right out of the camera. But by now I'm starting to experiment more with some of the other film simulations shooting some classic chrome aerials, and also using the Acros film simulation, shooting monochrome aerials, and sometimes using the black and white warm adjustment settings, which was one of the coolest creative features that was first introduced on the X-T3. At the end of February, pro cyclist Rebecca Rush, who I'd met the year before, came to Alaska to race in the Iditarod Trail Invitational. The ITI, as it's called, is the ultimate cold weather winter ultra endurance race. There's two versions. You can either go 350 miles to McGrath or 1,000 miles to Nome. I've got numerous friends who've gone both distances. 
Uh, my friend Bayot, who works for Google, has walked to Nome six times. Yeah, he's walked pulling a sled across the frozen Alaska tundra and across frozen rivers and the frozen sea ice of the Bering Sea six times. That's how he likes to spend his early spring break vacation. It usually takes him anywhere from three to four weeks to make that distance. Even the 350 mile version is really tough. I've done numerous 100 mile snow bike races. In fact, two weeks before Rebecca came up, I had just done my fourth Sioux Sitna 100, which is an ultra 100 mile race. I felt really strong going in, so I was hoping for a fast finish, but a snowstorm moved in quickly about halfway through the race, and I ended up pushing the last 27 miles. It took 35 and a half hours. Yeah, the ITI is like the next level up. It's, as I said, it's one of the hardest ultra winter races in the world, and people come from all over the planet to try to compete in this thing. And this was a big deal for both of us because Rebecca Rush, a world-class pro cyclist, seven-time world champion, has never actually done a full winter race like this. And so this was a big challenge for her. And for me, throughout my two decades of pro photographer experience, this was my very first full video project. At this point, I didn't really consider myself a video shooter. Uh, I'd done some short clips for social media and for my blog, dabbled a little bit, but I'd resisted jumping into the pool for a couple main reasons. First of all, I love the power of still imagery. And I was also terrified of the whole Pandora's box of all the commitment of time and equipment that video requires. But all that aside, I took on this project for two main reasons. One, because I have immense admiration for Rebecca Rush as being someone who's dedicated to pushing her own limits and inspiring others. And two, because the X-T3 is an incredibly capable video camera. And so I really had no excuse. And when you're self-employed and a client comes knocking at the door, your answer is always, yes, I can do this. So I was confident with the X-T3's abilities. In the last video, I told you that an accomplished director had used the X-T3 to film a full Hollywood-style short movie called A Different Beyond. So my approach to documenting Rebecca's ITI experience was a little bit more simple, and it closely matched my typical fast and light shooting style. I often use the X-T3 handheld, and I shot with a number of prime lenses, like the 14mm, the 23 f1.4, the 35 and 50 f2, and the 50 to 140 zoom lens. Sometimes I use the vertical grip because it holds two extra batteries, and video shooting takes a lot of battery power, especially in sub-zero temperatures like we had out there on the course. In those kind of conditions, it almost becomes a necessity to have those extra batteries right inside. And during downtime, I could use the grip to charge two batteries at once with the 9-volt charger. Before the shoot, I spent some time talking with one of the Fujifilm training sales managers on the phone, so he gave me a whole bunch of really good beta on shooting video, you know, real good primer to get me started. So we started here in Anchorage, and we filmed some of the pre-race stuff, and it did some interviews with Rebecca and some of the other racers. Then we shot the actual start of the race, and then we traveled by bush plane, leapfrogging to a couple of the different checkpoints in the finish line. My companion out there was Allison Davis, who was Rebecca's marketing manager and producer. And Allie had a lot of experience producing video, so she was a great inspiration and a great help for me out there. And we just had an awesome time because there was a whole lot of downtime when we were waiting for racers. And we were just great trip mates. We had a really fun time together. And even though I was pretty much a video newbie at this point, my years of outdoor photography experience really came into play here, and I felt comfortable shooting and capturing scenes with different vantage points and using different lenses, you know, knowing how they're gonna portray the scene, you know, capturing motion, and of course I've watched movies my whole life, so the whole idea of cinematography and you know, camera vantage points and tracking motion and everything, that's all been burned to my visual memory because I've just grown up seeing all that stuff. You know, and as with any kind of thing, whether you're shooting video or stills, you're trying to capture those moments. And so being able to recognize those moments, you know, that's a, real, that's a skill that I've developed over the years. So my experience translated really well to video. It was actually a really fun change of pace from what I'm used to, and it was an incredible challenge for me to shoot in this entirely new way. I gained a ton of experience and knowledge, which also helps me as a guidebook writer, you know, stuff that I could put into the next version of X-Series Unlimited and help other photographers answer their video questions. Anyway, Rebecca did end up finishing the ITI that year, so she completed her challenge, and the result was a 23-minute production for Outside TV called Rush to Alaska. And a bunch of my footage was used, and I got a full director of photography credit, which was my first huge milestone for me. So what do you know? Just like that, I suddenly became a pro cinematographer as well. Anyway, you can watch Rush to Alaska here at this link. After the ITI, I headed down to California for some sunshine and warm weather. Took my mountain bike, saw some friends, rode in LA, rode in San Luis Obispo, rode in Santa Cruz, 
Then we worked our way to Northern California where we did a trail running race. My wife did the 50K, I did the half marathon, got second for my age group. I did one 10 mile training run before the race. So hey, off the couch, yeah. And then we went to Marin County where we met up with Rebecca again and went to a special screening of her movie Blood Road. Now, this is a really incredible documentary. It's about Rebecca's journey riding her mountain bike down the Ho Chi Minh Trail looking for the place where her father was shot down and went MIA when he was a pilot in the Vietnam War. I highly recommend Blood Road. It's an amazing movie. It's definitely worth watching. Also in Marin, we went to the Mountain Bike Hall of Fame and the Bicycling Museum, did some hiking in the headlands, you know, past the Golden Gate Bridge. Just a really fun time soaking up the heat. And during this trip, I had a chance to test out Fuji's brand new 16 millimeter 2.8. This was the next in the line of their little weather sealed primes, or the Fujicrons as people call them. Uh, I love the 35 and the 50 F2, and the new 1628 was a really welcome addition to that kit. And as the same size and relative view angle of my old Nikon 2428, which was my favorite wide angle for years back when I was a Nikon shooter, that was my bread and butter wide angle lens. So this 1628 from Fuji, just you know, like I said, I felt right at home with it. Incredible quality, gorgeous color rendition, almost no distortion. I actually did a full review of that lens here on my channel. You can find it here. And that spring, Fujifilm also introduced the X-T30. This was the little brother sister to the X-T3, and the X-T30 was an amazing upgrade. It had the same sensor and processor as the X-T3, a lot of those same creative features, so, so essentially the same image quality, same performance, even high-end video specs, it could shoot at 4K. And it had the little AF joystick, which the X-T20 didn't have. So overall, the X-T30 is an amazing little camera. You know, $600 less than the X-T3 at the time, and so, you know, as I've said about all the cameras in this series, the X-T30 was probably the best mirrorless camera for the money at the time, you know, compared to just about anything out there. And the only real limitations it had against the X-T3 was that it wasn't weather sealed, it had a little bit less metal on the body so that it wasn't quite as durable, and had a smaller internal buffer, but with the faster processors that were in these cameras, this was much less of an issue as it was with like the X-T10 and the X-T20. Also had a max frame rate of eight frames a second where the X-T3 is 11 and had slightly reduced video specs, but still shot in 4K and it was certainly capable enough for just about anything that most people are gonna use when they're shooting video. So after the California trip, it was back to Alaska for more springtime aerials. I love flying and shooting aerials in the springtime because the light's still incredible. The mountains are still covered with snow, but it's clear down here in town. So I don't have to shovel out my parking spot before I go. And I also started my photography on the brain lessons that month. I'd actually had the idea while I was on the California trip. So when I came home, I filmed my first lesson. And I did one lesson every month after that, all the way up until 30. In addition, my blog hit 3 million all-time views. So that was a huge milestone. I did a bunch of podcasts that spring as well. I always liked doing those because I love geeking out on cameras and just talking to people about photography and stuff like that. So I actually have an archive of all of the podcasts that I've done. You can find that under the Learn tab on my blog. So spring in Alaska turned into May and I've had some really awesome times out at the glaciers photographing icebergs. This was one of my favorite evenings out there I've ever had. Such incredible light and just great scenery and it's never the same. It's always different when I'm out there. And then of course May gives way to June and then it's summer in Alaska. Just the best time to be up here. Long days, great weather in the early summer. So t lots of trips out to the glacier in my Cessna, lots of bush flying, lots of mountain biking and mountain bike racing. Did the whole series, got third place for masters again. Unfortunately, that summer there was a huge wildfire down the Kenai Peninsula that lasted most of the summer and that was only about 50 miles away. It made for some really good sunsets, so I had fun shooting those with the 100 to 400, but the smoke was almost unbearable if you wanted to go out and hike or ride your bike. So a lot of times we'd wake up in the morning, open the door, look outside, Oh, no, too smoky. Close the door and go ride the trainer. I just go work. So it was a really challenging summer in 2019 in that respect. But I did get away for a couple times that summer. Uh, I went back to Idaho in June to photograph Rebecca Russia's second year of her gravel camp. So that was a really cool experience. And then in July, I did a trip down to Glazer's Camera in Seattle, where I did a, a class and a photo walk. And during that weekend, I stayed with my friend Victor, who was the Fujifilm rep at the time for Seattle area. And he's a guitar player, so we geeked out on music and guitars and watched a bunch of YouTube videos. Uh, but we also, as we were watching some of these videos, some of these tutorials that these music guys were giving, you know, it kind of occurred to me, I was like, hey, wait, I can do that. I can do that with photography. So that actually inspired me to come home and start revamping this channel 
and create a whole new style of tutorial, which is the stuff I'm doing now. I had a few videos up before then, but really nothing to speak of. But when I came home at the end of July, I put together my first video, I shot it with my iPhone, and I had my green screen already because I was using it for my photography on the brain lessons. So I already had some experience doing video tutorials. The first one I did was the one about my favorite film simulations. Uh, and right now that's gotten almost 90,000 views. It's the number one viewed video on my channel. And after that I did another one and I started doing them one every week. And I'd do that for two or three months and then I'd take some time off, kind of regroup and then come back and do more. And now I just hit 10,000 subscribers last month, which was a huge milestone. So I guess I'm doing something right and I have you guys to thank for all of your support, for watching my videos and supporting the channel. At the end of the summer, I did two more trips to Idaho. Then it was back to Alaska for September fall foliage shooting. Autumn comes pretty early here in Alaska. And so we had beautiful colors in the middle of September. So I shot a bunch of aerials and I shot some close-ups. Uh, just having such a fun time with the X-T3. Did you ever notice that Fuji and Fun and Fall all begin with the same letter? Hmm. And of course, we all know what else happens in September. Cyclocross, once again. So one year after I had shot my favorite action photo of all time, I went in again for another season to push my creative limits and try some new techniques. And during one of the races, I found myself in the exact location and setting as I had when I shot that iconic photo one year earlier. So the pressure was definitely on, but I try not to look at it that way. I tend to go into every scene thinking fresh, trying to do something different. And from a creative standpoint, this year's photos certainly satisfied my itch to constantly try new things and push my creative boundaries with photography. In the end, no matter what I'm shooting, my goal is always to walk away from the scene with an original photo that I love that truly excites me. Later that fall, I went back to Photo Plus, where I got a chance to see Fujifilm's latest camera they had introduced earlier that season, the X-Pro3. I've never been an X-Pro shooter. I'm an X-T guy. But I know that it has mass appeal with a lot of people, so, out of curiosity, I decided to join one of the photo walks that Fujifilm was sponsoring and take the X-Pro3 out for the afternoon. And I gotta say, I was really impressed by that camera. I can totally see the appeal. With the X-Pro3, Fujifilm gave that camera the same sensor and processor as the X-T3. So it brought the X-Pro3 up to the same level of performance. As they did with the X-E3, Fujifilm left off the thumb pad buttons on the back of the camera. And instead, they had the joystick and the touchscreen swipe gestures. And they also had some other advancements. The LCD screen on the X-Pro3 was reversed, which meant that to see it, you flipped it down. And that was a different configuration that people were used to. And of course, it caused some people to totally freak out like the world was ending. Of course, the X-Pro3 still had the hybrid viewfinder where you could use the optical viewfinder or the high resolution electronic viewfinder. In addition, Fujifilm included a little sub-monitor on the back of the display. So when the screen is up, you can see the little sub-monitor. And if you want to see the full LCD screen, again, you flip it down. Sub-monitor had two different functions. One, it can display regular shooting data, or you can display the little label of whatever film simulation you're currently using. And this is a really cool feature. As someone who grew up shooting SLRs and film, you know, we always tore off the back of the little tab on the film box and stuck that in the slot on the back of the camera. So you knew what film was loaded inside the camera. So I love this new feature. I thought it was so cool and so innovative. And one thing about it, it kind of fostered a style of shooting that's very conducive to what the X-Pro3 offers. And so there are some times where maybe you want to turn the LCD screen off and just shoot optically and look at the world as you see it. And so you're shooting photos with the same process and mentality as what we used to do when we shot film. You didn't know exactly what the film was going to look like until you got it developed. So you could, in theory, shoot the same approach with the X-Pro3. You could choose whatever film simulation you wanted. And so you'd have an idea of how the scene would be portrayed by that film simulation, but you wouldn't see the exact results unless you flipped the screen down and looked, or if you waited until you were done. You went home and processed your photos on your computer when you downloaded them. And if you do change film simulations using the function buttons, that will be reflected in the little sub-monitor. You'll see a different logo. So I just really enjoyed seeing these original style film logo tabs in that little monitor. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and I think that it's a really cool feature. I think it does foster a different style of creativity if you want to shoot that way. You certainly don't have to. And of course there were some people who railed about it on social media and on the web. I can understand that people who never shot film might not fully understand the significance of this little film tab. There was another aspect of this that was kind of fun. So that meant that Fujifilm actually had to come up with a logo for Classic Chrome. 
which they'd never done before because classic Chrome film never existed. It was supposedly influenced by Kodachrome, uh, but they had never stated as such. But here's the actual classic Chrome logo they came up with. So what do you think? The X-Pro3 had some other cool creative settings as well. Remember the X-T3 had that warm, cool black and white adjustment setting. Well, the X-Pro3 expanded on that and called it monochromatic color. So in addition to going warm and cool, you could also go uh, red and green as if you were doing a white balance shift. And so this just offers even more creative control for getting highly stylized, unique imagery. It also had a new clarity setting, which I thought was really cool. I love this setting. Between the monochromatic color and the highlight and shadow tone and the clarity setting, you can get a real wide variety of creative looks in the X-Pro3. And it had a brand new film sim, Classic Neg. Based on Fujifilm's old Superior print film, this was designed to reproduce the look of classic negative film you know, that produced the prints that so many of us grew up on. You know, those snapshots that defined the way we saw the world back in the day. I love Classic Neg, and it has a really interesting look. The way I describe it, it has a harder tonality than Classic Chrome, with Fuji-style colors that are closer to the Pro Neg film sims, but with slightly less vibrancy and more muted tones. I actually love this look, and I've been using it a lot in my photography during the past couple years. As someone who grew up on Velvia, you know, with these rich, highly saturated tones, I find myself attracted these days to trying to create more subdued looks in my imagery that somehow impart a more suggestive look instead of giving it all away up front. I just think it's interesting to see how our styles and our creative ideas evolve over the years. After Photo Plus, I hopped back across the country and spoke at the Kenmore Camera Expo. This was my third time doing a presentation for that event. And I closed out the year in Alaska with some more aerial and glacier photography. And I visited the Knit Glacier twice in one week during the month of December. And it was interesting because, you know, the scenery was the same, but the atmospheric conditions and the light and the visual quality of the ice was very different. And it's just another reminder of how cool it can be to visit your photography happy place numerous times throughout the year or over the course of multiple years. So 2019 was another big year for me. I shot a ton with my X-T3, you know, fell in love with it even more. The best camera I've ever used. Had a great time playing around with the creative features like the warm, cool black and white settings. Got much more comfortable shooting videos, started doing the YouTube tutorials. And of course, Fujifilm released two awesome new cameras that year, the X-T30 and the amazing X-Pro3, and two new lenses, the 16 2.8 and the 16 to 80 zoom lens. But we're still not done yet. There's plenty more to come. In the next episode, I feature another new camera, and I delve even more deeply into the world of filmmaking, including shooting my very first music video. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, please keep the comments coming, and let me know what your photography happy place is. And of course, if you are a Fuji shooter and you haven't checked out my best-selling ebook X-Series Unlimited, you definitely want to look at that. It's a 400-page guidebook that will show you everything you need to know in order to get the best results and have the most fun with your Fuji. So please subscribe to my channel, check out some of my other videos. You can find me on Patreon and social media at Dan Bailey Photo. You can visit my website and blog as well. Thanks very much for watching this video. Have fun with your Fujis out there, and I'll see you next time.